Okay, now I'd like to introduce uh, Li Xuan, who's a founder and runs the Save China Tigers program to specifically uh, address some of these issues in relations to her experiences with uh, um, tigers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to um, my presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Mongford for his wonderful presentation, which really lays out the background for what I'm going to talk about. And uh, you know, you, you see there a lot of been work done for you know uh, breeding up endangered species, and uh, there also have been some successes in China as well. For example, the Prevasky horses and the crested ibis, and uh, another thing is uh, Davis deer. So, but today, uh, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on a predator introduction, which has been uh, very controversial, uh, simply because it's a totally different scenario as well. Uh, for predator introduction, uh, for predator introduction, um, there, are, broadly speaking, there are two kinds of introductions. One is straightforward uh, translocation. Basically, you translocate. Uh, a certain animals that endangered or not endangered from one area to a new area where they have gone extinct. And this is fairly easy if they have enough individuals. And the second scenario um, basically concerns a species that's very endangered, they might not be found in the wild, and in that case, you cannot just even take zoo animals and dump them in, into the wild. You have to go through an extra stage. And this is the extra stage that I'm going to talk about. OK. Um, first of all, I'd like to give you an idea on um, what the Sultana tiger is. Because a lot of you have heard about uh, uh, Bengal tigers or Siberian tigers. The Sultana tiger is least talked about. However, in terms of conservation, is probably the most significant. The reason is the South China tiger is actually the ancestor tiger to all tigers on this planet. Practically all tigers that you know, whether they're purebred or not, are descended originally from the South China tiger, which originated in China two million years ago. And, um, and it also has been Chinese culture for thousands of years, and the earliest record was about 8,000. And obviously, um, you know, if you are involved in conservation or biology, you know that South China tiger, or the tiger, is a flagship species. If the tiger is gone from its habitat, it means that the habitat may get lost for other species as well. And this is really what happened in China. So our project, Save China's Tigers, um, to rewild in order to introduce the South China tigers, um, basically touches on three different areas. One is environmental development. By uh, environmental development, I actually mean biodiversity. You know, Dr. Monfort talked about the biodiversity loss. You know, once you lose the, uh, the uh, land, the biodiversity, if you don't introduce, you're going to lose the land and eventually you're going to lose the habitat. So what we are trying to do, actually, through the South China Tiger Rewilding and Reintroduction Project, is really to aim to gain more land for wildlife. But it's, not, it's, it's more difficult to convince people we need to gain land for antelope, for deer, but it's, more, it's easier, relatively speaking, to gain land for an animal that people care, in this case, which is a cultural symbol of China. And then the second environmental aspect is we need to breed and rewild the tigers we do have. Since the South China tiger is highly endangered, they're less than 10 if at all in the wild. What we have now is really captive population. But you, as I said earlier, you really can't just dump a captive population directly to the wild. You really have to go through an interim stage. The reason that they have to go through this interim stage is that in the wild, a feline or predator, uh, in this case a tiger, spends up to two and a half years with their mother to gain that ability to survive in the wild. And that ability is not just like hunting, but also the ability, for example, to avoid dangerous game and to, to be able to breed and feed your offspring. Uh, I just had a case last week, one of our tigers um, probably must have been tampering with fire, and he got some porcupine porcupine quills on his throat. 
Now, that's very dangerous because porcupines are known to kill cats. So um, this is kind of danger that uh, you know they face in the wild and the kind of thing they will have to learn through the rewilding process. And economic development, um, through Save China's Tiger projects, we actually aim to bring sustainable, uh, a sustainable, sorry, sustainability model to China, because traditionally conservation has been done by the government, and uh, you know if the um, you know government has enough funding, you know some species will get some funding, but um, you know in bad years, you know the amount of money that goes into conservation is very very little, and uh, what we try to do is to create a model, the model that I have seen working in Africa, uh, in particular ecotourism model to bring to China. So in order to make conservation sustainable, that means means you get animals with the wildlife to pay for themselves. You get you pay the local community because the local community will gain through tourism, through you know jobs created uh, through tourism. And you know, better finance, we have to, you know, we know conservation is very expensive, particularly uh, a rewilding breeding project, as Dr. Monfort has also mentioned. So we need to uh, have a substantial amount of funding. And it was not enough to raise money just from the public, even though we're registered uh, public charities in many different countries. So we have to support the project through business. And that's something that we have been, um, you know, that's why we've been able to support this project. And social development uh, in terms of uh, capacity building, China lags behind in uh, conservation uh, expertise. And that's not a surprise because uh, conservation started fairly late. And so one of the things that we try to do is to train in Chinese officials as well as ground workers in conservation. For example, we bring them to South Africa and let them see what South Africans do on the ground and, and see what we do on the ground. And we also want to provide economic opportunities to the local communities involved in conservation because if they don't get involved, they're not going to support tiger conservation or any conservation at all. I just want to briefly touch on this slide. Uh, this slide. And uh, um, as you see, uh, this is done by a group of scientists um, at the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center. The planet has certain boundaries. And once we surpass certain boundaries, uh, we may have reached the point of return. And that means you know, we may not be able to save certain species or you know, um, a certain, uh, uh, reverse damage. In the case of the uh, uh, planetary boundaries that we have surpassed, the, the worst right now is actually biodiversity loss. The uh, background loss of uh, species right now is between 100 to 1,000 um, uh, times more than normal. And the same thing you know, applies to tigers. Um, the tiger, there are uh, nine subspecies of tigers, and three have gone extinct. And the next one to go extinct is the South China tiger. In fact, when I started the project in, in uh, 2000, uh, there had been predictions by certain uh, conservation groups that the South China tiger will go extinct by 2010 if nothing was done. And so let's look at the numbers. And the number of tigers uh, had 100 years ago, there were 100,000 throughout Asia in tiger range countries. Uh, what's interesting um, with that figure is that in 1950, in a matter of 50 years, the tiger numbers have dropped to 40,000. So 60,000 disappeared between 1900 and 1950. In China, the cause of that demise was actually uh, chaos. China went through a period of incredibly uh, unstable uh, time, war, internal wars, anti-Japanese wars. So China lost 13,000, 36,000 uh, tigers. Uh, between 1900 and 1950. Uh, during the unstable period, many people start moving into the interiors of China, basically taking over the last habitat that, in which the chi tiger lived. And we would compete for resources, for food. And it would also you know, kill um, uh, the tigers themselves in order to take over the land. And then what happened next for the 4,000 tigers left is that when uh, the Chinese ta Communist Party took over, and there was, because it's a party made for the people, the farmers started a campaign 
trying to eliminate predators that pose threat to their lives. And therefore, there was a mass uh, campaign to eliminate what we call four pests. It include tigers, leopards, wolves, does. And obviously, such elimination of wildlife happens all the time. It still occurs now in South Africa, where I am. My neighbors continue to poison you know, the caracals, the bat-eared wolves, and we often have to save the babies of orphans if we found them. However, if you can imagine, in a country with a lot of people, when it's an organized campaign, it's very effective. So by 1980, the number of tigers dropped basically to nearly nothing. You know, we, we continue to say that we have 10 to 30 in the wild, maybe, because simply from time to time, we continue to get report that there may be wild tigers, wild South China tigers. So in this dire situation, what do we do? We can't really find wild species, uh, wild Sultan tigers, and we had very few captive Sultan tigers, and they were not doing well in zoos. As Dr. Monfort pointed out, that's one of the things, you know, once they reach certain numbers in captivity and their numbers drop again because of environmental problems. And in Chinese zoos, uh, when I started the project, um, the, the breeding number, uh, the breeding rate was very, very low, and there were a lot of deaths and a lot of illness as well. So the South China tiger is critically endangered and the only one available for introduction, however, basically rely on these captive animals. And what do we need to do is to actually take them out of zoos, take them out of captivity, and put them in a natural environment to see if can, they can gain back their ability to survive in the wild. So this is a really critical stage um, before reintroduction for predators and for any predators, really, because all predators need to learn, need to acquire that skill to survive in the wild. And that just doesn't come naturally. They may have the instinct to kill. Anyone who has a cat will know you throw a ball, the cat goes after it. However, to translate that into the hunting ability takes a long time. So what we have done is um, we have done something quite unusual. But this is not really unusual if you, um, you know, have listened to what uh, Dr. Monfort said. There are a lot of uh, uh, ex situ conservation where animals are taken out of their uh, natural environment and then bred in a totally different place. And through cross-border collaboration, we're able to resurrect, you know, for example, black-footed ferret and Davis deer and uh, um, Privatsky horses. So for the South China tiger, what we have done is to use South Africa as a springboard to fast track this, what we call rewilding process. When I first started this project, we couldn't find the word to appropriately, to appropriately translate the Chinese word ye hua. Ye means wild, hua means the process of becoming wild. So in the end, our strategist, uh, Gus van Dyke, who's a carnivore manager with Pillensburg Park National, uh, National Park, he just said, why, why don't we just use rewilding? So now rewilding is being used for predator uh, rewilding as well. And South Africa has other advantages because it started wildlife conservation pretty early. It has a huge number of uh, uh, wildlife managers and that could uh, help to achieve our goal. And another advantage is availability of land and also praise. And obviously, in, you know, we are actually not the first one that started the uh, South China Tiger Rewilding Project. The first one was started by China. However, Due to all kinds of limitations, domestic prey, domestic stock we use in, in rewilding. So the tigers never really learned to, to, to hunt. You know, uh, it's a very different thing chasing after a duck or a chicken than chasing after a wild antelope. And however, all of this, you know, anything we have done in South Africa is really to aim to bring the tigers back to China. We simply use South Africa as a springboard to quicken the process. And the, um, uh, our next challenge is really to develop reserves in China to which the tigers can be returned. But before we do that, we actually need to select the appropriate sites. We all know it's a challenge in China with 1.4 billion people still growing, even with one-child policy. And um, 
um, we need to find a site that we can spare for the tigers, and then we have to introduce prey. And reintroduce the prey should be a, a straightforward process. Uh, we have done that in South Africa as well, and South Africa has translocated, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of heads of animals. It's a big success story, and um, you know we can do the same thing in China and get the reserves ready before we introduce the South China tiger back, the rewild South China tiger back. So what we have done, and this you can see here, this is a Madonna, and she was in Chinese Zoo at the time. And we translocated two pairs of tiger cubs from Chinese zoos plus an adult later to South Africa between 2003 and 2007. And they really got real VIP treatment. They got a private little charter plane by a friend of mine from the Johannesburg Airport to our reserve. And this is uh, uh, the uh, Laoho Valley Reserve. Laoho Valley Reserve itself uh, was actually restored from 30 3,000 hectares of defunct sheep farm. 17 farms were acquired. And uh, they were really overgrazed, and we tore down the internal fences and built a new reserve. However, we're not using the entire reserve for the rewilding project. We're basically building, uh, we build camp systems. And there are certain reasons for that, because what, you know once you actually provide the tiger with a number of game to hunt, by the time the tigers hung down the game, let's say we introduced 20 in a rewilding camp, and they will start hunting. By the time the numbers reduced to five, it becomes very, very difficult to hunt. So they regulate the difficulties of hunting themselves. And this is our infrastructure, and we have electrified fences. So tiger learn early on when they come in touch with electrified fences not to touch them. And they, they can't re resist that urge from time to time because they hate it. But they're smart that they, they will learn to stay away. And we have um, you know river into the camps, so it simulates the, the wild habitat. So if they, you know, they feel the heat in the summer, they will go soaking in the water. Rewilding um, has been normally successful um, out of the, all the um, first generation tigers we brought from Chinese zoos, all have learned to hunt. And then the first tigers born in South Africa five, four or five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, they also learned to hunt. And what we really do is we go through the system as if they're in the wild. In the wild, for example, the mother would take a little antelope or little deer back for them to play. And through this uh, play fight, they eventually get the hand of it. They will learn that the thing they've played and killed is actually their food. So as they progress and their size grow bigger, we give them bigger game as well, and slowly they will actually progress to kill the bigger game, or to hunt the bigger games. Cats always have the killing instinct, but to actually link killing to food is one thing, and to also actually to be able to acquire the skills of hunting is another thing. And hunting requires a lot of time uh, you know, to learn. But so far, we've been, uh, you know, we've proven that this can be done. And another important aspect of uh, rewilding is actually breeding, because the, the tigers, having lived 10 generations in Chinese zoos, having had enormous problems breeding, we weren't sure whether they'll be able to breed at all. You know, one of the problems is the genetics. We weren't sure if they would be breeding with us. But I also knew that the tigers weren't happy in Chinese zoos, therefore giving them a natural environment, they may decide to do something different. And so all the tigers that came from China ended up breeding with one another. And this is the first pair of tiger cubs born in complete natural environment raised by the mother Madonna. So having um, Basically, the project has been going on for nine years in South Africa, and uh, we have really um, proven that um, the, the tigers can learn to hunt even even though they have passed three, I mean, ten generations in captivity. Uh, unlike what some people have predicted, and they basically say, you know, once they're born in zoos, no way they're going to learn to hunt. We've proven otherwise. And all tigers uh, basically um, have bred. Um, all the tigers came from China bred. And we're on to next generation of breeding, basically between the tigers born in South Africa. 
and we have now 14 tigers under our care, 11 were born in South Africa. And all of them, except the newborns from last year, are ready to go back to China. So China is our next challenge, and it's taken much longer than expected and than I wanted to. And I knew um, I was a little bit too ambitious, and the Chinese government officials we work with were a little bit too ambitious, but hopefully we're getting there. Um, we have scientists from overseas, including uh, quite a few American scientists like Dr. David Smith, Dr. Gary Kohler, uh, have been to China. We've been working with the government, trying to identify the pro suitable sites. And uh, you know, after the uh, sites approved, then we can start the restoration work of these sites. And uh, you know, we hope that we will succeed probably next year. Um, anyway, that concludes my um, talk. I would like to thank thank you for listening to my uh, my presentation. Thanks uh, ICCF for organizing it, and thanks for the Smithsonian for co-presenting this very important subject, which many believe will be the future for conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um